Morning guys, I just finished um, posting all your work for math and spelling and we just got off our little math conference call so we are going to going to go to Bible now. Um, we are in 1 Samuel chapter 30 um, starting verse 7. If you remember, David's been through a pretty rough time lately. Um, he had the issues with Saul and then he left and went to the land of the Philistines and and then um, which was a bad decision, and then he, um, and then he uh, had the issues with, um, with you know, he's trying to hide and have this con going and, and pretend to be attacking the enemies of Israel and pre and pretending to attack. I mean, attacking the enemies of Israel and pretending to attack Israel and everything's going on. And he has this issue with Achish, and Achish tells him he can go into battle, and David's willing to go into battle, but then. He gets rejected by the Lord of the Philistines, and then he comes back and says, "If that wasn't bad enough, <clears throat> his all their their whole city Ziklag is burned to the ground with fire, and all their relatives taken." And uh, so David's in a pretty rough spot. And and oh, in addition to that, all his men are talking about stoning him right now, killing him with rocks. So he's in a pretty rough place right now. And so that's where we pick up in First Samuel thirty-seven. And so David, in verse, actually go back to verse 6. In verse 6 it said, And David strengthened himself in the Lord, his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the Himelech's son, Please bring the ephod here to me. And Abiathar brought the ephod to David. And so uh, that's what they would seek the Lord with. Um, remember, Saul didn't have the true ephod when he was seeking the Lord. Uh, verse 8 uh, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And it's kind of interesting. <clears throat> we see that when David is seeking after God, sometimes he seeks God over things that seem pretty obvious, right? Um, before, he um, sought after God about the Kenites. He was like, um, Should I go defend the Kenites? That made sense to seek the Lord after about that, because he didn't know if they should come out of hiding or not. But then he said, Should I stay behind their walls, are they going to defend me? And you'd think, of course they're going to defend you. You just defended them. You saved their life. Why would they give you up? But he asked God, and he did. And so now that he's coming back to the Lord and getting his heart right again and getting his mind uh, focused back on God, he seeks after God again for something that would seem obvious. And, and, and of course, I mean, think about it. If somebody kidnapped your family, You'd be like, should I go look for them, God? I mean, it's, it's like, well, obviously, yes, you should. I mean, if somebody took Mrs. Hanley and, and Charlotte and Susu and Silas, I probably wouldn't even think to ask God what I should do. But but we're going to see him, and God does answer yes um, to pursue them. We're going to see him having that that heart receptive to God's, God's leading um, and not focusing on circumstances is going to be what actually causes David to <clears throat> have success here. And so David asked God, God, do you want me to pursue them? Uh, am, will I overtake them? And God says to David, excuse me, pursue them, for you shall overtake them and recover all. This must have been such a lift of, of <clears throat> happiness to David, because God tells him, God makes a promise, you're going to recover everything. You're going to recover everybody that you, your whole family and all, everybody's families, you're going to recover all your stuff, you're going to recover everything. And so David must have been just overjoyed. So David went, he and the 600 men who were with him, and came to the brook Besser, where those stayed who were left behind. So these men who stayed, um, and it says in verse 10, David pursued he and 400 men, for 200 stayed behind, for they were so weary they could not cross the brook Besser. So um, there are 600 men. We remember, they've been traveling. They, they got ready for battle. They got everything ready. They were up early. They traveled the whole distance. And this is quite <clears throat> a long distance from the land of the Philistines, remember. It's right like in the middle of, of Israel. It's really deep in Israel. So they traveled a long way to the battle, only to have them kicked back out again and had made to leave. And they had to travel all the way back home. Very, very long journey. And then when they went to get home, they were already exhausted. And, um, and, uh, sorry. And so <clears throat> they um, they um, traveled all the way back, and um, by the time they got there, they were ready to rest, 
and all their houses were burned down. <clears throat> and um, and so they um, they had no way to rest, and so they had to just keep going and keep going and keep going. And by the time they got to this place, the Brook Besser, um, a third of them, 200 of them, were so tired they couldn't go on. And picture how tired you have to be to, you know, stop looking for your... To stop looking for your, um, sorry, my phone is ringing. Um, to stop looking for your uh, family. You know, picture if you were out looking for your dog, if your dog was lost. Um, let me just. If your dog was lost, <clears throat> would you walk out in the yard, look around from left to right and go, oh, well, he's gone. Uh, I guess I, I guess I'll just you know, leave now and just never see him again. And uh, of course you wouldn't do that. And so um, here, uh, these men um, are exhausted. I mean, think about it. I mean, much more to your dog if it was like your brother or sister or, or <clears throat> mom or dad or your child. If you were so tired, you just couldn't go on and you needed to rest. I mean, think about how tired you'd have to be. I would, I would be looking all night. I wouldn't be like, well, you know what? It's been like two hours. I gotta go get a bite to eat. I'm tired. I'm hungry. You know, I want to keep going. So these men are very, very, very weary, and um, and so just because remember this, just because God promises us something doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, right? It's guaranteed that it's gonna happen, but it doesn't mean it's going to be easy, right? Um, this was a very difficult trek for these guys, and so um, so four hundred of four hundred of them advance on beyond this brook. And so they come to this field, and in the middle of this field, all of a sudden they come across this guy laying there, an Egyptian man. And he's laying in the in the field pretty much close to death. Now, if I were one of these men, it would be very tempting for me to be like, listen, I know that it's kind of the right thing to do to um, care for him and see if he's okay and everything, but listen, my first part is my family here. I need to find them, and I can't waste the time stopping and 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 um, and caring for this guy. I mean, I don't have. That's first of all. Secondly, we don't really have anything. We were just marching. We have just kind of what's on our maybe a snack. Somebody's a granola bar or something, and you're not really pa packing a three course meal or anything like that. And you're not packing, you know, bottles and bottles and bottles of water. But David stops. And he sees this Egyptian man, obviously in need of help, and he, um, and he picks him up, and he, it says in verse 12, um, they let him, uh, verse 11 and 12, they gave him bread, and he ate, and they let him drink water, and they gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins, and, uh, and so they're sitting here, and this takes a little while, think of it, it takes a little while to gather up all the food, and sit him up, and give him food, and kind of give him rest, and I'm sure it was very, very aggravating for some of the men who wanted to just go and find <clears throat> their families. But David was determined. You see, when when your heart is in the right place, and David was thinking that he was God promised him he's going to overtake them. So with the promise, there's no need for him to to you know break every rule in the book and 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 <clears throat> run at a breakneck speed. He's going to overtake them. But if he feels God leading him to go do something else first. He's going to listen to that call because God told him he's going to recover. He's going to overcome and recover everything. So he sees this person. He knows it's the right thing to do, no matter the circumstance, to help this person out. And he helps him out because he has the confidence that he's going to recover all. Now look what happens. He, because his heart is receptive to God's call, and he's not trying to use his own man, uh, manly, humanly lo logic, he takes care of this person, and they ask him, obviously, um, what's going on? And so it turns out that he hadn't eaten for three days or, or drank anything for three days and three nights. We've gone without food or water for three days and three nights in the hot sun, probably marching and everything like that. It'd been a while. So they sit this Egyptian man up and they say, who do you belong? Cause he was obviously a servant. They say, where are you from? Who, who do you belong? What's going on? You, you, you're sitting here about to die in the field. What, what's your story? Once he's strong enough to speak. He said, I'm, ah, oh, man, he goes, I'm, I'm originally from Egypt. I'm, I'm a servant <clears throat> um, of an Amalekite. And uh, 
I three days ago I felt I felt sick and my master just left me behind. And by the way, this is a little bit of an indication of what the Amalekites are like, because we talk about God dealing with the Amalekites very, very harshly. It might seem like he's mean, but this is just a little glimpse of what the Amalekites are like. They don't care about people. This this uh, Egyptian man was sick, and so the Amalekite goes, "I'll just leave him right here, and we'll just give him we'll leave him with no food, no water. He'll die, and that's fine with me because to me he's just property. Who cares about him? That's what the Amalekites were like, and not to mention all the other things that they did that were terrible. But um, so he's talking, but they're like, "Oh, interesting. Oh, that that stinks. You know, got sick. I'm glad you're feeling better now." And he goes, "Yeah." So we were, the Amalekites, the people that I served, they were in the southern area of the Cherethites, and uh, they were going through, they were raiding some of the areas of Judah, because that's what they did. They would, like, take it, they wouldn't, they usually wouldn't, like, march right up to somebody and have a, a noble battle. They would just, like, attack different people at different times when they were unexpecting it. He goes, um, we were attacking different parts of Judah and uh, southern area of Caleb, uh, and we came to this town, uh, the Amalekites came to this town, called, um, you know, uh, Ziklag, and uh, we and we burnt down the town and, and kidnapped the people inside it and uh, took them away to our camp. And so that must have obviously been like, what? Sparking their ears, and they said, you you came to Ziklag? Because remember, Ziklag was the name of their city that there was burned down. They said, you came to Zik Ziklag? You guys came to Ziklag? And you took away the kidnapped the people and, and were bringing them back to, their, to your camp? He goes, yes, yeah. He goes, uh... Yeah, uh, that's what we were doing. And obviously the guy has no idea that that's theirs. And David jumps upon this and he said, can you show me? Can you show me where the camp is? And and the guy was like, yeah, sure. He goes, but on one condition, just don't give me back to the Amalekites. I don't want to be with them. I don't want any part of them. They're awful. And he doesn't want anything to do with them. And obviously David's like, sure, join our join our group. And um, <clears throat> And so because, now think, remember, they're just marching. They have no idea where the Amalekites are. They have no clue where they are. They stop and help this this one helpless little young uh, young man feed him food when it doesn't seem like the convenient thing to do. It seems like it would be the worst thing to do in that circumstance is to stop. But they have no idea where they're going. They help this man with no no agenda of their own, and all of a sudden <clears throat> he's able to point. Yeah, come on, right this way. I can show you right where their camp is, and he leads them right to this camp. And I'm sure the camp was in a place that was hidden. The Amalekites like to be sneak attack type people and everything, and so I'm sure that it's a hidden camp. And they uh, and he shows them. In verse 16, um, and when he had brought them down, this Egyptian brings them down. There they were, spread out all over the land, eating and drinking and dancing because of the great spoil which they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and the land of Judah. And so David's like, there they are. We found them. And he attacked them from twilight until evening of the next day. So a full, that means at nighttime, like five or six at night, all through the night, all through the morning until the night of the next day. It's 24 straight hours of attacking. And uh, it said, not a man escaped except for 400 men who rode on camels and fled. So these Amalekites, obviously, so there's 400 men on the, of the Amalekites who ran away. So there obviously must have been 400 more than 400 men that that were there to start with and um uh, and they uh and so david and his men remember are only 400 people so this shows us the amalekites are kind of cowardly too because they must have had at least 800 people to start with it twice as many as david but david and his men attack them and they seek to run away and so it's <clears throat> verse 18 a wonderful verse so david recovered all that the Amalekites had carried away, and he rescued his two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking, either small or great, <clears throat> sons or daughters, spoil or anything they had taken from them. David recovered all, recovered everything. And then listen to this. Not only did they recover everything, but David took all the flocks and herds they had driven out before the other livestock and said, this is David's spoil. So basically they got an additional spoil, all the stuff the Amalekites left behind because they like they had got all, they got all their their sheep and livestock and everything back, but then in addition to that, all the sheep and livestock and everything that the Amalekites left, now it's there. So they actually came out of this making more, having more stuff, and so they they travel back and they're bringing their wives and kids and every but everything back. Obviously, traveling more slowly. Now David came to the two hundred men <clears throat> who had been so weary that they could not follow David. Remember they had kept the camp. Uh, at the brook, and, and probably at the brook because brooks are hard. They, they have to, like, wade across and everything. And so 
they went out to meet David and meet the people with him. And when David came near the people, he greeted them. They, I'm sure it was a wonderful reunion. They, they were so happy. I mean, they were sitting here at this brook the whole time going, oh, please, I hope they do well. I hope they find them. And they were just really worried because it's their families, their wives, their kids. <clears throat> and um, they, had left the, they had left any unneeded things along with them, and the 400 had gone ahead. Um, <clears throat> verse 22, But then all the wicked and worthless men of David went of those who went with David, answered, and they said, You know what? Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we had recovered, except for every man's wife and children, that they may lead the, them away and depart. So this is a very understandable sentiment. Picture being one of these 400 men. You're tired too, right? <clears throat> you're tired, you're exhausted, and a third of the group says, we can't, I can't go any longer, and I'm too tired. And you're like, we got to go get, get our families back. And you're like, I'm just too tired. You're too tired for your, to go get your family. Please, can you just go get them? Please, can you go fight for me? And like, I'm, and they're like, I'm tired too. I want to sleep. I want to rest. But, and I, but now you're going to expect me to have less people as we go and fight for our lives and for our families. I'm just too tired. I can't do it. You probably very easily think, look down on these, um, these 200 that stayed behind. And this is what these this group did. They said, you know what? Because they didn't <clears throat> join in with us and fight with us and, and get over their tiredness and go with us. Let's give them their wives and kids back because obviously we're not going to keep their families. But we're going to keep their sheep and their cattle. We're just going to drive them away. Say, here's your wife and kids. Go in the wilderness. We don't want to see you anymore. And so it would be very tempting to have that mindset. But listen to David. Remember, David is filled with compassion. Now that when his heart is right, he's filled with compassion, just like the compassion for the Egyptian. He has compassion for here. He says, verse 23, My brethren, you shall not do so with what the Lord has given to us. See, these men feel entitled. They think, I worked hard for this. I did this. I did that. I did this. And I deserve everything. David is like, no, no, no. God has given it to us. Yes, we were the ones who fought in the battle, but God gave this to us. It's, it's, uh, he said, um, God has preserved us and delivered into our hands the troop that came against us. For who will he do in this matter? But as his part who goes down to the battle, so shall his part be who stays with the supplies. They shall share alike. So David establishes a very important principle here. He said some people go, and they go and do a work, and some people stay back, and they stay with the stuff. They stay with the supplies. And so we sometimes think of people that go as maybe missionaries or, or things like that. And the missionaries could very easily be like, you're, you Americans staying home in your cushy houses and your cushy churches. You're not doing anything. I'm doing everything over here in Africa and Asia. And, and, and they are doing a wonderful, wonderful work. And it's, it's a very difficult thing. God needs missionaries. But he's establishing here that, that the people that stay back and pray for and support the missionary are just as important as the are doing a work that's just as important as the missionary. You know, <clears throat> if somebody is, you know, just like a preacher, preachers on, on the stage on a Sunday and preaching the message, that's really, really important. Somebody's got to do that. But also, just as important, there might be a group of, of, of um, people who, right before the preacher preaches or during the, during the pe preacher's message, they're sitting there praying for him <clears throat> and praying that his message goes out and, and those people are just as important. They play just as pivotal, pivotal of a role as the preacher does. And they're not seen. They're not up on the stage. But they play just as important of a role as the preacher or somebody who gives to a church. Uh, somebody who gives to the work of the church to, and supports it but with their money is just as important as the people who actually do the work. And so David's establishing, establishing this principle here. And uh, so it was from that day 40 made a statue and an ordinance for all of Israel to that day. Now when David came to Ziklag, he sent some of the spoil to the elders of Judah, to his friends, saying, Here's a present for you from some of the spoil of the enemy of the Lord. So David, <clears throat> intelligently, smartly, sends some presents over into Judah, the elders of Judah. Remember, he's not living in Judah anymore. He's saying, These are from the enemies of the Lord. Here is some spoil, a free gift for you. And obviously, what are the people of Judah going to think? Oh, they're going to think, fondly of David. Remember, David was from the tribe of Judah. And um, and uh, the rest of it um, were all the different places that David was um, 
sent to them. So chap, we're gonna next time we're gonna be in chapter thirty one of the book, and it's the last chapter in um, First Samuel, um, and uh, <clears throat> and we're going to do that next time. We're gonna see what happens to Saul. It ends. The First Samuel is basically the life of Saul, and so it ends next chapter. So think about what you think is gonna happen. All right, see you guys later. Praying for you.